Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Friday edition of The Yard. It's a little bit later than I wanted it to be, and your good friend and host is tired. So I can't promise you 90 minutes today, but we'll get you a good show. How'd that be? I'd like to thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, too, man. We had a, uh, a great meal tonight. Uh, my son went and met with some friends and uh, had a good time. Brought some Bulldog Burger Company home for me. I had the chicken wings. Told you guys before, that's kind of a hidden gem, those chicken wings. Really like those chicken wings. I think you'll enjoy them, too. Be sure and go check them out. Uh, next time you're in town, maybe have them as an appetizer. It'd be good. I had them as an entree. I was hungry. Trying to get a lot of protein in a diet, you know, before I hit the road. You know, got to have plenty of energy. Got a long drive on Friday. By the time many of you listen to this show, I'll be well on my way to Albuquerque, New Mexico. But next time that you're in Starkville or Tupelo or in the Ridge and Flowood area, go by and see Bulldog Burger Company. Three great locations to serve you. Have the spring rolls as your appetizer. You'll be glad you did. Make you and everybody around you better looking. And uh, I can tell that many of you are not having the spring rolls as your appetizer. And that's as, mu- that's as far as I'm going to go with that. But there are many of you that need spring rolls in your life. But while you're there, get that great restaurant quality hamburger. You'll be glad you did. I don't know. My favorite these days may be, I'm kind of back on the Lauren a little bit. The Fresh from 15 is always a winner. The Bulldog is a great one too. Just a great straight ahead rock and roll American cheeseburger. You can't beat it. That's where I would start. If you're a newbie to Bulldog Burger Company, start with the Bulldog Burger. I think that you'll be satisfied with that selection. You get a little more on the wild side. Maybe the Smokehouse is for you. Perhaps the Mission with a Pico de Gallo on the side. That way you can control your onion distribution. I love Bulldog Burger Company. You will too. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right. Big news today on the football front is 15 new Bulldogs enrolled for spring classes. I don't know that we've ever had a list as extensive as this. And that says a lot about the quality of, of the instruction and the preparation at their previous schools. Outstanding effort, and also, to your staff doing a good job identifying players that can come. Whether they redshirt this year or not, they get the benefit of a spring practice under their belts. Here are your newcomers. Jacoby Belazar from Southwest Mississippi Community College. He is a Baton Rouge native that attended Capitol High School kind of neatly tucked away off Plank Road there in North Baton Rouge. Capital High School produces quality football players every year, every single year. And like a lot of players from that school district, uh, Jacoby went the junior college route, got some seasoning there, and was outstanding for them. He led the Bears in back-to-back years in receptions, receiving yardage, and touchdowns. Will be a slot receiver for Mississippi State. Absolutely explosive in the open field. That's a guy, too. If you miss a tackle, it's going to be six. High school wide receiver Justin Brown from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. That's Blackman High School. That's another one of those high schools that you routinely see produce Division I prospects. He's a big-time player. Really, really like him. I know that our Paul Jones thinks that he may be maybe the most undervalued player in the class. He had 74 catches for 1,229 yards and 18 touchdowns as a senior. Let that sink in for a second. 18 touchdowns. That's one of the things we need at Mississippi State when it comes to the passing game is we need finishers. That's what Justin Brown is. When I watch tape, that's one of the things that I look for. What do guys do in the open field? Well, Justin Brown catches the football, tucks it away, gets back up to full speed quickly, and can routinely – beat the safety in the foot race to the end zone. You don't score 18 touchdowns by accident. you got to have some skill. Punter Keelan Cremens is also here out of Melbourne, Australia. Ranked as the number seven punter in his home country. The third, excuse me, number seven punter nationally in our country and third out of uh, his organization, Pro Kick of Australia. Uh, so this is a guy, too, that's been around for a little while. Uh, I understand he never even had a cell phone. Visited 
Mississippi State uh, a couple weekends ago, his very first time to be in the United States. Expecting him to be a big-time player for Mississippi State. Running back Seth Davis out of Katy, Texas, has been an absolute phenom in the Lone Star State. Another huge year as a senior. An All-State player in Texas had 2,570 yards, averaged 10.7 yards a carry. The thing that I love about Seth Davis is he gets up to full speed so quickly and he has a little wiggle to him. He can make people miss in the open field, free himself, and move the chains, and in many respects, get into that secondary, and then it gets awfully dicey from there. Really excited about him. Malik Ellis, one of the most unheralded recruits in this class, and I don't understand why his ranking continued to drop. Now, he is not the biggest kid. He has a great frame, but he's not really filled it out yet. Much like Charles Cross did when he got here. But uh, this, this is an athlete playing offensive line. He's not an athletic offensive lineman. This is an athlete that just happens to be an offensive tackle. Comes from Laurel High School. That is a high school for many years. It was not very Mississippi State friendly, but it has been in recent years. For a while there, it seemed like everybody from Laurel went to Ole Miss and, and you know, kind of lauded away, lauded away their, uh, their careers. You know, in many respects, kind of languished up there, never really reaching their full potential. We hope Malik Ellis does. Now, Malik Ellis ranked as one of the top prospects in Mississippi. He was a dandy dozen selection. Big-time player. Now, do we expect him to do a lot of big things right now? No, we don't. We don't. This is a guy that's got to bulk up, learn to play athletically at a new playing weight, but the fact that he's here in the spring, he'll, he'll look like a different player come fall. But I, I suspect we'll see a redshirt year for him because, number one, we don't need him to make an immediate impact. But also, he needs to bulk up a little bit. Cornerback Luke Evans. This is a great get from Darcel McBath. Uh, McBath had a really, 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 really good class. I played at Chaminade Badana College Prep last year. They were one of the better teams uh, in the state of Florida. He had six pass breakups, was considered one of the leaders on the team. Another guy, too, that long, rangy, athletic corner that uh, we have come to know in the three years. Darcel McBath has been our cornerback's coach, kind of recruits in his own image. Quarterback Chris Parson, no surprise there. We knew that he was going to be a mid-year enrollee. And uh, there is some discussion that Chris will be able to participate in spring practice. You know, he got banged up last year. But I understand that his recovery is going exceptionally well. And that while they will be careful with him in the spring, there is a good chance that he is a full participant in the spring. One of the top quarterback prospects in the South. He's a four-star, 247 sports composite. He was also the region MVP in the state of Tennessee last year. Of course, he didn't get to finish up this year. Former Taylorsville High School running back Jeffrey Pittman had a really good uh, year at uh, Hines Community College. He is ranked as a top junior college running back in the country for the 2023 class. Averaged just under 100 yards a game this season while in Raymond. He is a player, too, that is a downhill runner. We need a very physical guy that can get out there and, uh, and, and kind of move people around. That's exactly who he is. Cornerback Kamari Rogers. Holmes County Central by way of Miami. He was a guy that probably should have been at Mississippi State last year. Came off the ACL tear. And I'll be honest with you, that, that's a concern for me. It is. He's had two ACL tears. And we'll see how, it, how that works out for him. Now, there's no doubting his talent. You know, he was a guy, too, that uh, a little thinly framed. You wondered about him putting on some mass. Uh, saw him this summer. And uh, he looks like he has bulked up some. It'll be amazing to see what Tyson and those guys do with him. He was a one of the top prospects in the country, coming out of high school. At one time, was rated the number one player in the state of Mississippi. He was committed to LSU at that time. And, of course, after uh, you know he, he decommitted from LSU, his ranking dropped a little bit. Can't say I totally, was totally against that. I do think Kamari is a, is a big-time player. And, again, didn't play a lot last year. He wasn't 100% healthy. So last year serves as a redshirt year. So he has four years to play four. 
Not your typical transfer. By any stretch of the imagination. Isaac Smith is on campus. He is Mississippi's 4A Mr. Football. Also the Gatorade Player of the Year. Rated as a four-star, as a number five player in the state. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, he is probably the best defensive player in the state. I do like Get Perkins from Riley a lot. Of course, he's going up to Ole Miss. I do think he'll end up playing linebacker. But as far as, like, true high school defensive prospects, I think Isaac Smith is the guy. If I had to rank them, I would go Perkins 1, Smith 2. I think Get is a little more explosive at times. But the thing about Isaac Smith, if you've watched his film, and if you haven't, I encourage you to do so. This is a grown man playing high school football. He tackles through people. He hurts people. There's no question about it. This is a guy that is a big, big big-time player. Zachary Tillman, 57 tackles, 13 tackles for loss this year for Florence High School. Participated in the Bernard Blackwell North-South All-Star Game. You probably could have made a case for him to be in a Mississippi-Alabama All-Star Game. Originally recruited as a safety, he outgrew the position, became an outside linebacker, could be an inside backer for us. He's very intelligent. This is a guy that can handle the checks. This is a guy that can get out there and help with the audibles. He can read what the offense is trying to do. I think he's going to be a leader for us. You know, And I think people say, well, Steve, who do you compare him to? I, I think he could be like an, an Errol Thompson type guy. Errol was another guy that was really, really intelligent. Zakari is too. And Zakari wanted to stay close to home. Uh, Ole Miss and Mississippi State both recruited him. Ole Miss elected not to offer. It surprised me when he went up there for an unofficial visit way back in the infancy of his recruitment that Ole Miss didn't offer. And then eventually they elected to pass on him. I think that's going to prove to be a mistake. I like Zakari Tillman. He's one of my favorite prospects in this class. And I do think he is where he needs to be at linebacker. Creed Whittemore also named uh, Mr. Football for the state of Florida, a four-star receiver uh, from the Sunshine State. He was uh, played quarterback. His dad, of course, played at Central Florida. His older brother was at the University of Florida. He decommitted and then promptly committed to Mississippi State shortly after an official visit to campus. I think this is one of those guys, too, we're going to look back in a couple of years and say, you know what? It was a great get for our staff. I think Creed Woodmore is, is a leader with a great football pedigree. I think his time at quarterback will help him at receiver. He understands what the quarterback wants, understands how crisp those routes have to be. Be interested to see how we utilize receivers in this new offense. But I expect Creed Woodmore to be a star at Mississippi State. Jacoby Albert, we've talked about him recently on the show. Big-time prospect out of Fairfield, Alabama, was a four-star recruit, originally committed to Auburn. And then with all the Brian Harson shakeup there last year, lost a lot of confidence in him. Jacoby elected to back off his commitment to Auburn and signed with Kentucky, announced his commitment to the Wildcats on signing day, played a little bit this year as a true freshman, 10 games mainly as a reserve and a special teams guy, we do expect him to come in and compete for a safety spot right away. And when states needs the position, uh, you know, Colin Duncan has now accepted an invitation to the NFLPA game, which means Colin Duncan's likely not coming back. So state will have to replace Jackie Matthews, Jalen Green, and Colin Duncan. Isaac Smith obviously will factor into that, but Jacoby Albert will be a huge part of that too. Nicholas Barmera is – been the starter for UCLA for three years, a kicker. 15 to 21 last year, including a season-long 49-yarder. Massimo Biscardi, of course, moving on. And it was a bit of an adventure at times for us. Uh, Barmera is a guy, too, that uh, has been rather consistent, especially under 40 yards. We expect him to come in and just take and put a stranglehold on that position. We do expect him to be your starter. Christopher Keyes from Indiana, formerly of Collins High School. Spent three years at Indiana, one of those a COVID year, so he has two years of eligibility remaining. Played nine games this past year, made two starts. Was a part of the Mississippi-Alabama All-Star team back in 2020. We expect him to be another guy, too, that could be potentially a free safety or a Bulldog safety. But that's 15 new Bulldogs. We feel great about all of them. I wouldn't throw any of these guys back. I don't, I don't really have any questions about them. 
I think every one of these guys has a role as we kind of move forward. I think that's a fair thing to understand. You know, it's one. sometimes you go out and you sign a bunch of developmental guys and you just kind of hope for the best. Now, Mississippi State currently has a 30-man class. There are some names that are still remaining. Leon Bell, one of them, recently took his official visit to Mississippi State. He will be a spring graduate and will enroll in June. As will Bryce Pollock, who was a high school player at a shallow high school in Snellville, Georgia. Ty Jones, expected to officially visit Mississippi State this weekend, will also enroll in uh, June, as will Kayla Bryant at Vicksburg High School. Kelly Jones from Clarksdale. You remember State had to hold off Ole Miss late for him. He is one of my favorite players in the class. I don't care what his offer sheet looks like. Kelly Jones can absolutely play. I'm eager to see what he looks like after a couple of years in the college weight room. Zay Alexander from Tupelo is another guy that dropped a bunch of weight last year. He's another guy, too, that could benefit from a year in the weight room and the fact that uh, we don't need him to play as a true freshman. I think it really bodes well for his development. Tobias Henton, linebacker from Hattiesburg High School, played defensive end much of his career and then played in a two-point stance this year, handled the transition pretty well. That was one of the things that people wondered about. Would he be able to play and get out and cover as a linebacker? Because really all he had done much of his career is just kind of line up at the rush in position and chase the quarterback. Joseph Head, edge a defender from Holmes County Central. One of the first commitments in the class will also be a June enrollment guy. Really excited about him. Amari Smith, inside line, excuse me, inside lineman. An interior lineman out of Brookhaven High School. We expect him to uh, come in and really compete. I think Amari Smith is one of those uh, sleeping giants. I think a lot of people maybe slept on him a little bit. I think he has a chance to be a big-time player at Mississippi State. Uh, Jalen Abram from Oak Grove is also an outstanding player. We do expect him to come in and compete. I, I won't be the least bit surprised if he ends up playing safety. I think once he gets in the college weight room, he is going to bulk up and probably be closer to 195, 200 pounds. He has a frame to carry without hurting his athleticism or dexterity. Could see him perhaps as a strong safety. Uh, Gabe Moore out of Louisville. This is another guy, too, that, uh, you know, lined up on the outside. Explosive player. Will he slide inside? He's already 6'4", 250, but he doesn't look it. He looks a lot more like 220. Carries the weight really well. Will he balloon up to be a 300-pounder? Will he be a guy that plays on the interior? I suspect he will be. But he could be like a Jaden Crumity guy that plays more of a five technique with his hand in the ground. So there's still some options there for him. Nakai Poole, wide receiver out of Norcross, Georgia. Another young man that we expect to enroll in June. Probably a redshirt year in store for him. I don't think there's much question about that. Uh, Eric Taylor will be a summer grad out of Southwest Mississippi Community College. Excited about him. Former All-American. Spent some time at LSU. Had a big year at Southwest Mississippi Community College. Jaden Hobson out of uh, Hillcrest. Jamie Mitchell, former Star- Starville High School coach, is his high school coach there. And this is a guy, too. We, we got him ranked as an 84, and that's just wrong. I'm just telling you, it's wrong. And we're going to look back one day, and I'm going to be sitting here telling you, I told you so. Jaden Hobson can really play. He has an amazing feat. So got another another athlete just happens to be playing offensive lineman. He doesn't move like the typical high school offensive lineman, which is why he had several Division I offers, including one from Mississippi State. Now, among your transfers, the only one that hadn't been announced yet is uh, Radar Jones out of LSU. Now, Radar, of course, had some academic problems last year, set out the year on academic probation. Not exactly sure what his situation is at this point. We'll try to find out for you. But he was not announced. Does that mean he's not cleared? Don't know. Don't know. Don't want to speculate. But uh, he is going to be a Bulldog whether he enrolls in January or he enrolls in June. Excited about him. And, of course, when you begin to think about um, so many players, especially in that secondary, they're coming in doing a good job for us, uh, eager to get these guys on campus. So, again, 30-man class, 15 of them already here. The other 15 expected to enroll in June. I guess there could be one or two to get cleared uh, between uh, now and then, but uh, now that class has begun, I don't expect to see a lot of movement there. 
there's always one or two it seems it's a bit of a straggler but uh, in this case I think everybody's done their homework and gotten their paperwork together now let's talk a little bit about scholarship numbers that's an important thing to consider too as it stands today there are 72 scholarship players for the spring semester you say but Steve I thought we could be at 85 well yeah that's when we start fall camp so we're at 72 that's that's counting the attrition of transfers you know we had 11 guys uh, go into the portal and ask if we transfer Dylan Johnson one of them and still that remains a, a matter of discussion I'm told he's not going to go to Washington could be Mississippi State could be South Carolina you know we'll see Auburn I know has been involved with him Ole Miss hosted him on a visit recently I just don't see him going to Ole Miss I'll be surprised if he goes up there I will be I'll be surprised but uh, of the, so 10 transfer outs right now. Of course, Dylan Johnson could come back, and that would take you back up to 73 uh, scholarship players. But you said, Steve, you, you had 15 more to come in. That's true. So what that guarantees you, let's say if we just stay at 72. Let's say Dylan Johnson goes to South Carolina. All right, that gives you 72 scholarship players, and then you add 15 more. That takes you to 87. Well, that, there's a limit of 85. So that means you can go ahead and suspect and expect a couple players to hit the portal in May. A lot of people are sick and tired of this, but the transfer portal has really been good to Mississippi State. It's like you only become acutely aware the players are leaving. And if you look at the 10 guys that left, by and large, you know, they're guys down the depth chart. Of course, Rara Thomas wasn't one of those guys. You know, Rara's a big-time guy. Now he's headed to Georgia. There's a reason for that. But by and large, it's been reserves. Now, some of those guys are young guys that we expected to eventually develop into starters. And so now you've got to replace them with other guys in that developmental pipeline. You basically lose the whole year you've invested in these guys. So it's not a victimless crime in many respects. But you can go ahead and expect now, come May, that you're going to see a couple or more go into the portal because we've still got to go out and sign some of the transfers. Now, I don't think that we take maybe perhaps as many transfers as many people expected early on, but we have got to get some tight ends. We have to. Rylan Godey, of course, is going to be here next weekend. You certainly wouldn't take turn him down, right? So let's say you take three more transfers. Well, then all of a sudden you need five players to leave in May. They're just preparing you, okay? So you're going to see between two to five players – hit the portal in May. And then there's going to be all these people that don't listen to the show, that don't subscribe to Gene's page. You're going to be like, I don't understand what's happening. Have we lost a team? Well, no. I mean, we're, I'm telling you in January right now, I'm telling you in four months, you're going to have close to half a dozen players hit the portal. It's not magic. It's math. It's not me just sitting here, you know, being Nostradamus and looking at a crystal ball. It's like when we have, we have an 85 limit, we have 72 on scholarship, and for sure 15 more coming in, you got to make some room. And there are some guys, there's still a few guys on this roster that are not going to play significant snaps. So it's important to understand that. It's not always a negative thing when a guy transfers. If we have a player that's never going to contribute and he leaves and goes somewhere else where he can play, that's a good thing. Let's take Daniel Greek as an example, okay? Daniel Greek signed as part of a two-quarterback class with Sawyer Robertson and Mike Leach's first class here. We expected that, right? We had to get two quarterbacks. We did because we knew that Keaton was leaving. We knew Garrett Schrader was leaving, so we had to kind of replenish the quarterback room. Daniel Greek was always a marginal SEC player. Big physical guy, great football IQ, but we didn't expect him to ever challenge for the starting spot. He has left us and enrolled at Tarleton State. He can play there. So he really owes you nothing to stay just so we can avoid some Facebook posts, right? This is his life we're talking about. This is his education. It's his career. Nobody should sit and be satisfied to sit on the bench. Everybody that's on this roster should be fighting for a spot on the two deep and pushing for playing time. And guys are in practice every day. They see it. And so sometimes they elect to leave, and that's what happened here. Basically, our entire depth chart behind Will Rogers hit the portal when it came to quarterback. That's not ideal. 
And, of course, Chris Parson coming in, that's big. But you've got to pick up a quarterback somewhere, whether it be a walk-on or somebody. You've got to have somebody step up and compete. But you begin to think every other transfer you take, that's one more guy has got to leave. So understand that in the weeks to come as you begin to see these transfer commitments. We're already two over. So every time you see a new commitment, that's one more guy that's going to hit the portal. I'm just telling you now. And so what I need you guys to do, you guys and gals, is when that happens in May, you can say, oh, yeah, this was expected. Don't let the social media commentary just absolutely run away with it, right? Because all of a sudden it's going to be Arnett's fault or Bracky Brett's fault or Larry Templeton's fault or Dr. Fogel's song. I mean, there's always going to be somebody to blame. It's got nothing to do with blame. It's about the betterment of our football team. If you got guys that aren't going to compete and contribute, you got to replace them with guys that potentially can. That's just the reality of life. Football's a business. You guys see it more than ever. I got a, a, something we're going to talk about in the final segment of the show that's probably going to blow your socks off when we talk about business. It's important to understand that. But there will be some additional roster movement in the months to come. Now, the portal window closed at midnight last night. So you're not going to have to deal with it for a few months. We'll get through spring practice, and then guys will see. Guys will understand. It's like all of a sudden you got thirty, you know, 15 newcomers going through spring practice, and all of a sudden if one of those guys passes you, you start thinking, you know what, maybe I need to go, maybe I need to go to Jackson State or Southern Miss. I've got to go somewhere I can play. i got to go somewhere I can get on the field. And so that's going to happen. It's not a prediction. It's a promise. You are going to have more players transfer out in May. You absolutely are. And to think otherwise is just to kind of be ignorant of the facts. Right? I mean, I've explained it as best I can. If we have 72 now and we know we have 15, we know we're over the limit. It always works itself out. It does. But it may not work out the way many of you want it to work out. It's like we fall in love with these kids. We, We follow them on Twitter and Instagram and we think we know them. You don't know them. You don't know them. And then when they leave, we take it all personal. I thought he was a good kid. We, how, did, how did you know? And listen, we don't go out and recruit bad actors. We don't have a lot of bad kids. That's one thing that I'll give Dan Mullen, Joe Moorhead, and Mike Leach a lot of credit for is we didn't go out and recruit kids that were cancers. We've had some guys out there that maybe have been a little difficult to deal with. But, um, you know, I can think of a couple in particular. But the reality of it is we don't have a lot of bad kids on the roster. So – you know, kind of your blind faith assessment of their character is usually on point because we don't go out and recruit bad kids. But there are some guys you're going to need to leave. They may not be bad kids, but they also may not be great players. And we need great players. If we're going to catch the LSUs and the Alabamas and Floridas and people like that, we've got to have outstanding players. It's not the Boy Scouts. Can't just have outstanding people. We've got to have outstanding players. So you got to make room. Got to make room. I remember one of the biggest meltdowns. We had a walk-on quarterback here recently that, that entered the transfer portal, and everybody's freaking out. And then I saw some comments like, well, how many snaps did he play? Well, I can tell you, zero. He was never going to play. He was just another guy on the roster. But people are losing their minds over a player they'd never heard of. It's like, well, Steve, what's happening? Nothing's happening. You got to walk on out there trying to get a scholarship opportunity somewhere or or try to get to a level of football where he can play on the collegiate level. It's not personal. It's the world in which we live right now. It's important to understand that. It is absolutely imperative that people understand. We're going to have some more kids get in the portal. I'm not going to run the numbers down for you again. A&M's had a ton. Look at the numbers, too. Ole Miss has had 20-plus in back-to-back years. It's going to be difficult to manage a roster that way. We talk about, is that model sustainable? I think when you've got to go out and flush basically a two-deep every year, it's not going to work out. you got to go flush out 25 players a year. Not to mention you've got uh, you know 25 or so graduating, so that's 50% of your roster. It's gone in a year. This is not the junior college system. So 
there's no continuity or consistency with things. So, again, it's just not sustainable. You can't get out there every single year and, you're, okay, I'm going to go process two dozen kids and replace them with two dozen more. At some point, that catches up with you on a recruiting trail. It's important to understand. I think the way we're doing it is the right way to do it. All right, time for today's top 10 list. Brought to you, as always, by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Blair is my friend, your friend, a friend to all in the mortgage industry. Doesn't matter your rooting interest. If you have a need, Blair can help you fulfill it. Blair is a guy that's been in the mortgage industry 21 years. And if you're in any industry for two decades, you're getting things done. Nobody gets to hang around that long without having some level of production. Well, that's where Blair comes in. Top 1% close ratio in the country in back-to-back years. Works for Fairway Mortgage. Not some fly-by-night subprime lender. A big-time company that's number one in customer satisfaction when it comes to mortgage loan origination. And if you reach out to Blair, I'm going to give you his personal cell number. You can call or text him today. 601-500-2344. Rates are coming down, too. Maybe time to think about a refi. Maybe time to get off the hamster wheel of renting. Buy yourself a home so you can leave something to your children. 601-500-2344. That's the best way to hit him up. And if you mention to him you heard about him on the boneyard, he's going to pay for your appraisal. That's about a $500 value. A lot of fees associated with getting a mortgage approved. It's nice to know that you got a friend out there that will cover some of that for you. That's Blair Chandler, again, at CloseWithBlair.com. All right. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. David Crosby passed away on Thursday. David Crosby, uh, a legend in many respects. We're going to talk kind of like some psychedelic music today, some hippie stuff. But David Crosby was an absolute innovator. This guy was part of some very big bands. And um, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, probably what many of you know his work best for because uh, Roger McGuinn was kind of the leader of the birds. But David Crosby was uh, very instrumental in the success of that band too. So our top 10 today is dedicated to the music of David Crosby. You may not agree with his politics, may not agree with his lifestyle. Guy lived a very tragic life in many respects. I think it's important to kind of understand that. A lot of these people that work in music are kind of tortured souls in many respects. David Crosby lost a girlfriend to a car accident. Found out as an adult that he had a son out there, kind of a long lost son. They reconnected. Also shared the love of music. Shared the stage together. Dave Crosby, now dead at 81. So here's our top 10 David Crosby songs. Come from three different uh, bands. Number 10 on the list from Nash and Crosby. That's Graham Nash and David Crosby. It's a song, Dancer. And there's some chanting that kind of goes along with this. And some of the lyrical content is, is a little bit contrived, to be quite honest with you. But I think the guitar on this is really good. I like the tempo. I like the vibe of the song. Number nine, another Nash and Crosby contribution. It's Carry Me, which I think is probably the best song of those two albums with Nash and Crosby. And, of course, uh, Graham Nash and David Crosby were together and Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. They just didn't work with Stephen Stills and Neil Young on these projects from the early 70s. All right, David Crosby solo track. Kind of a protest song in many respects. And it it starts out and it kind of fades like an instrumental for a long time. And then Dave gets kind of angry. And we talk about people that ruined our country and ruined our land. And of course, this is written in the middle of the Vietnam War. It's a great song called What Are Their Names? Let's basically, let's hold them accountable. Let's make sure we know who these people are. Let's identify these people that are these big policymakers that have put our country in harm's way. And so it's not a recent phenomenon that uh, musicians and people in social culture are upset with the federal government. It's always been that way. All right, number seven, another David Crosby solo track. It's the great song Laughing from his debut solo album. If you're unfamiliar with that one, it's uh, it's kind of a legendary al- album in many respects. If, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's uh, If I Could Only Remember My Name. It's the name of the album. They digitally remastered it back in 2021 and re-released it. So the sound quality is much better. 
be sure and check that out. But it's a song called Laughing. The whole album is pretty, pretty strong, to be quite honest with you. I think a lot of people thought, okay, well, David Crosby was with the Birds, and he was kind of a, a support player, even though he wasn't. Then he was with Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and he kind of took off as a songwriter, but he's kind of part of a conglomerate in many respects. And then he went solo. Then he did this work with Graham Nash. But David Crosby, very, very talented guy in every aspect. Number six, we're going to get our first bird song, first of three bird songs, The Birds. Roger McGuinn, too, uh, played that uh, Rickenbacker guitar. He kind of made it famous. A lot of people in alternative music play those things today. It all started way back in the 1960s with the birds. But we're going to go with the great song, Eight Mile High. One of the things that made the birds so special, too, it wasn't just the guitar work. It's the harmonies they used. That's the thing, too, I think, when you look at David Crosby's career, a lot of harmonizing David's career. But Eight Miles High, number six on your list today. Number five, the song Wooden Ships. David Crosby was an accomplished sailor spent most of his adult life on the water, and he wrote Wooden Ships when he was out at sea one day. He came back and presented it in Crosby, Stills, and Nash recorded the song. That's your number five song today. Number four, The Birds. This goes back a few years. So you want to be a rock and roll star. Kind of an irreverent track in many respects, and uh, a lot of people have written those songs similar to that. Number three, some people would probably argue with me this should be number one. I could make that case. I could. But I won't because I have it number three. But it's from Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and it's almost cut my hair. They titled the album the same thing. Almost cut my hair. I think it was six weeks ago, whatever it was. But uh, it's a legendary song. Number two, a, a more modern release from Crosby, Stills, and Nash. In many respects, I think it is the quintessential Crosby, Stills, and Nash song, and it's the great American classic, Southern Cross. Love the vocal on that. It's such a cool vibe on that song. If you're unfamiliar with it, and I suspect you're probably not, even if you're a young person, I know you've heard this song at some point. Maybe your hippie parents didn't play it for you, but uh, somebody did. Number one, though, we're going back to the birds. It's not Mr. Tambourine Man, which was a cover of a Bob Dylan song. It was an unreleased Bob Dylan song at the time, but it was something that Dylan had recorded. This is actually a cover of a biblical book from the, from the book of Ecclesiastes. The birds turn, turn, turn. A very, very popular song out in uh, California, the Haight-Ashbury Circles, a lot of people involved in psychedelia. A lot of people were involved in the protests in the Vietnam War, and in many respects, this song was very anthemic for them. You know, there's a time for war, a time for peace. They kind of forgot the first part of that, though, right? Um, you know, war is a necessary part of life at times. And I don't just mean militarily. You know, sometimes that's how it is in life as individuals. But in a, an incredible song, they take this incredible poetry from the Holy Bible and turn it into one of the more memorable uh, songs of the era. So number one, the birds turn, turn, turn. That's your top 10 at uh, David Crosby list. I want to thank Melanie Moody for the suggestion. She hit me up and she, has, she knows I have a soft spot for, uh, for fallen artists. And so we try to commemorate them and honor their work. Uh, we didn't do Lisa Marie Presley, but I, I would be remiss if we didn't at least uh, offer our condolences to her and her family. You know, she just didn't have a very big catalog. Some other people have reached out and said, hey, Steve, could you do something with this? Kind of tough, uh, but a very tragic loss. At 54 years of age, we lose Lisa Marie Presley. And if uh, memory serves me correct, Elvis's mother died in her 50s due to a heart ailment or in her 40s. Uh, Elvis Presley, of course, died, heart issues, many of it uh, kind of drug-related. And then uh, now Lisa Marie. So, you, you know, Maybe there is a genetic issue involved. We don't want to speculate, but the reality of it is that families face a lot of tragedy. Lisa Marie herself buried her son two years ago. So a lot within that family to deal with. You know, we're all living life on life's terms, man. I mean, it's like in death, there's no respecter of persons. You know, you might have more money. You might be able to stay alive a little bit longer because you can afford better health care. Maybe perhaps you get a better physical trainer. You're able to take a better medication. I don't know. 
But at some point, death comes for us all, as it did for David Crosby and Lisa Marie Presley. And so uh, very grateful for their contributions to American music and hope that you'll enjoy our list today. And again, this is we're going back. We're going back, uh, you know, 55 years or so with some of these tracks. And so for many of you, it may be the first time you've heard these songs. But again, I encourage you, as always, uh, visit Roy's list on Spotify, Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. You can follow Roy on Twitter, and he will not tweet out a picture of his food. He won't do that. He's not that kind of person. There are a lot of other people that are. They're more than happy to show you that they're eating a steak tonight while you're at home eating ramen noodles. Roy's not going to rub it in your face. But I would encourage you to follow him on Twitter at Dogmatic67. That's again at D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. Roy born in 1967. Around the same time, some of these great songs were hitting the radio airwaves across this great country of ours. So again, thanks as always to Roy Samanti uh, for the things that he does to kind of keep this show running. I didn't even tell him we were doing this tonight. He probably knows me well enough to know. I've already sent him a list. He'll get up in the morning and he's like, yep, I got it. And I want to thank you guys, too. I got some feedback, too, from uh, some of you guys. You know, we did uh, Gordon Griffin's idea. Some of the great rock bands of the 80s talked about their new releases. And I had a handful of people hit me up and said, you know what, Steve, I've never heard these songs. One person in particular said, yeah, Steve, I have heard many of these, but I appreciate you putting a list together. I think people understand I am the 80s hair metal expert within these parts. And I know a lot of these bands, or at least some of them. And uh, so I go see them play live. I enjoy the new stuff. I mean, anytime that I'm on my way to the show, I always listen to their new stuff. Because, you know, there's not a lot of bands that are releasing music that are nostalgia acts. Yes, they'll play the hits, but they want you to buy the new record, too. So they're going to play a lot of songs off the new record. So I like to familiarize myself with all that uh, before I get to a show. But uh, I like the old stuff. I like the new stuff. I like anything that rocks, that really rocks. I don't like corporate rock. I don't like how contrived it all is. But I like people that are true to themselves and true to their own artistic vision. And I'm very appreciative that many of the bands of my youth are touring again, are still touring, and have never, never stopped touring to keep the rock alive in the United States. There really is no rock, you know, presence in these award shows anymore. It's a joke. It's almost like we've decided, okay, look, we're going to prop up all these pop teen superstars at the expense of rock and roll music. America was founded on rock music. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. You know Campus Bookmart well, and if you don't, shame on you. Next time you're in Star, we'll go by Campus Bookmart and see them kind of neatly on the backside of campus there. Go by and see their smiling faces. They'll be happy to assist you when you make your next selection. Matter of fact, I've got a sack full of Campus Bookmart merch. I'm taking to New Mexico to give the wife tomorrow. She wanted one of those Mike Lee shirts. I got her too. Got her the dry fit, and I got her the, uh, the, the hoodie. And living out there in New Mexico, even though you know it's a few more weeks to go, it's cold. You need a sleeve. It's a much different deal, right? So I went by there, dropped some coin, got some good merch. I'm happy to have it, ready to see her smiling face as she gets it. Uh, maybe it's time you just bought a gift for somebody you love just for nothing, no reason at all, and you love them, right? Just do it. The kids are going to need new baseball clothes anyway, right? Baseball season will be here in less than a month. So we need to be a part of that, right? If you can't make it to town, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays, and that is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bucks, incomplete. And as always, too, that doesn't count if you're getting a truckload, right? You know, standard orders apply there. So just be smart about that. We've only had one or two incidents with that. I just want to mention that to you. And everybody's been cool about it, right? Everybody's been great. I think both of the customers, they call and said, hey, here's the deal. They're like, okay, cool, thanks. I appreciate your patronage of Campus Bookmore. I love that place. And uh, started really only started shopping there like in the last 10 years. And I wondered why I stayed away so long. And a lot of I just didn't know, didn't know about it. Didn't know where it was. Didn't know who they were. And now I'm happy to partner with them. The people are like my family. I love them. I absolutely do. All right, Mississippi State women's basketball picks up a big win. Granted, Auburn is not a, ba- a great team, but any time that you get a win in a Southeastern Conference is a big deal. And State jumps right out of the gate here with an 18-5 lead after one, and we're thinking, man, we're fixing to blow these ladies out. 
will give Johnny Harris and her team a lot of credit. If they come back and they have a 13-8 to eight second quarter, and all of a sudden you look up at the break, it's, it's 26-18. to 18. And so they're within single digits. You think, okay, if they can go on a run here, they can really make this interesting. Well, that's exactly what happens in the third period. They outscore us by eight, and after three quarters, the game is tied. And at times, Auburn had the lead. But in the fourth quarter, coffee is for closers. And Coach Sam Purcell and his ladies, they got a pot full of coffee when it was all said and done, outscoring Auburn 25-11. to Our best offensive quarter of the night, our second best defensive coordinator quarter. We finish up with a 72-58 to win and State doing a good job kind of putting things away late. Great teams do that. Good teams do that. There have been times in the past that we haven't been able to do that. Bulldogs now 14-5 and on the year and 3-3 three and three in the league. Auburn falls to 10-8 and eight and 0-6 and in the league. We've got Kentucky coming up this weekend. I don't know how they fared tonight, but prior to that, they had one SEC win. So they got to come to Humphrey Coliseum. Uh, Bulldogs have won two in a row, a chance to extend that streak, get back on the you know, winning side of the ledger in the conference and get above 500. Really important few games for State, for sure. There's no questions about it. Uh, let me see if I can get these stats pulled up here for you. Let's see if we can get that done for you. Let's see. Jessica Carter with a big game. Big. And, you know, and that's the thing, too. If we're going to get to where we want to go, Jessica Carter has got to help carry us there. Yeah, Sunday's game against Kentucky is a noon tip. Noon tip. That's the We Back Pat game. It's going to be on the SEC Network. But before we get to all that, let's talk about the uh, Auburn game. A lot of people played in this game, especially for Auburn. Johnny Harris, give her a lot of credit. Played a lot of young ladies, for sure. Uh, only a handful of them scored. But, uh, you know, good for her for kind of spreading the minutes out. Auburn held to 5 of 18 from 3 and 24 of 62 from the floor. When you start looking at the numbers here, they absolutely filled it up in the third quarter. 80% shooting. A stark contrast to the first quarter where they were 2 of 12. Just 16%. But things kind of got going after the halftime adjustments. That says a lot about coaching, right? But in the fourth quarter, Sam Purcell says, you know what, we're going to counter what you did. They hold Auburn to 5 of 16 from the floor uh, there in the fourth quarter and just 1 of 5 from the three-point line. Auburn also under 50%, really not getting the line much, 5 of 11 from the free throw line, so less than 50%. Now, on the Bulldog side of things, we had four scorers in double figures. Jessica Carter led the way, 24 points, also pulled down 11 rebounds, so a double-double for her. And then Jerkelia Jordan also with a double-double, 14 points and 12 rebounds. Jessica Carter also a little foul trouble too and still had a big game. As an A. Johnson, 13 points, seven boards. You can see it's a, it's a team effort here. Alana Smith, 12 points, just the one board. Uh, but, you know, 38 minutes of action to lead the team. Uh, Debrescia Poe, still in a starting lineup. Uh, nine points for her, seven rebounds. It's like you see these numbers and you begin to realize that the starting five is kind of carrying the weight for State right now. I mean, you had some players out tonight. Uh, State a little shorthanded. Not that we're not used to that after what we went through last year. Doug Novak probably gets to ride the escalator in heaven after uh, what he endured last year as our coach. But, uh, yeah, the starting five kind of having to carry things tonight. Uh, no no bench scoring for the Lady Bulldogs. Only played eight players. And the fact that we were still fresh in the fourth quarter says a lot about our conditioning staff and our ladies' commitment to work. Bulldogs 21 of 32 from the free throw line, just 3 of 10 beyond the arc, 24 of 52 from the floor. And State came out hot, hitting 50% of their shots. Uh, The worst period for State was in the second quarter, and uh, that was when Auburn kind of made their run and pulled even, just 4 of 12 from the floor. And then State jacked up 15 shots in the third quarter, making just 6, shooting 40%. But in the fourth quarter, the decisive fourth quarter, Stayed 6 of 9 from the floor, and then really it became a free-throw shooting contest late as Auburn just trying to, to extend the game. And State steps up, icy, 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 12 of 14 
for 85.71%. So great job from the ladies there. And uh, just kind of breaking it down here, 40 points in the paint. That's usually going to work out well for us because we have Jessica Carter. 12 points off turnovers for State, 19 second chance points, 12 on the fast break. The game was uh, tied five times. The lead changed hands six times. And again, credit Johnny Harris and and her group because, you know, listen, you're already not winning. You got to go on the road to play a team that is. And you know they, they wanted to play well for Coach Harris. And Johnny Harris got a nice ovation. Uh, from this Mississippi State crowd. Not that we expect anything less, right? I mean, we, we are a class organization. We have a lot of class fans. Uh, not everybody gets on Twitter and talks trash to our players. Most of our people understand. And so I was very, very happy to see that. Johnny Harris, part of some great memories here at Mississippi State. And a lot of people wanted her to get the job. Uh, she didn't. It's ironic. John Cohen likes not to hire her. And then he makes the move to Auburn, and now she has to work for him. And that's that's got to be a little chilly at times, right? I mean, like I'm now working for the guy that didn't want to hire me, right? And uh, Johnny's got to help herself a little bit too. You know, 10 and 8, you know, had a bad year last year, not having a great year this year. And then the SEC, there, there is a lot of parity in the league, but there's also some teams that are just not very good. And Auburn may prove to be one of those teams. But, uh, again, they gave State a good effort tonight for three quarters. Just ran out of gas there in the fourth quarter and stayed knocked down the free throws to put this thing away. But it is an interesting dynamic over on the Plains. And uh, as somebody else mentioned to me, too, you know, while he did not hire Johnny Harris, he did hire Sam Purcell, who is from Auburn, who has a dad that is a legend at Auburn. And it makes you wonder when and if the time comes that you got to find a replacement for Johnny Harris, does John Cohen come after Sam Purcell? You hate to think in those terms, but that's the reality in which we live. You know, John hadn't been shy about uh, making the phone call to somebody with a 662 area code. So just something to watch. And, again, I I think Johnny gets another – this year and at least another another year. You know, I I would think that's the right thing to do. You never know how bad the the season's going to go or, you know, what the atmosphere will be like. But you got to feel like she'll get another year. And I think she deserves it. I think Johnny Harris – uh, the fact that her first head coaching job is in the Southeastern Conference uh, might not be the best of things, right? Because, I mean, it's a very competitive league. I mean, you got the defending national champions in this league, and you have teams that regularly go to tournaments. You almost wonder if Johnny would be better off going to maybe the G5 level for a couple of years and then getting elevated. But, hey, you, you can't control who hires you, right? And so good on her for taking that job. But, um, you know, of course, there's been a change in leadership at Auburn. So, you know, kind of all bets are off. you got to win some games. You absolutely have to win some games. And as I mentioned earlier, Kentucky, that's the Sunday game, should be a game at State wins. Not a great Kentucky team. You know, we, we went up there when Michaela Epps was up there at Kentucky, and it seemed like even our best teams just couldn't find a way at times to win those games. It's like Epps would always just get hot late, and we were powerless to stop her. Well, thank goodness she's gone. But uh, you're kind of looking here at the um, – if I can get the Kentucky website to work for us here. Uh, I'm trying to see what their record was in the midweek here. And we'll see. Because prior to tonight, they had um, they had not won. They had won one SEC game. Let me just pull up. Let me just go to the SEC website. That always seems to work, right? Usually. So, Kentucky, there you don't get my click. All right, let me go to the SEC uh, women's basketball clubhouse here. And just kind of see, you know, uh, where things are. I think we have a pretty good idea. Um, kind of, I guess we can recap the night here. Let's see here. So Tennessee beats Florida 74-56. South Carolina doubles up Vanderbilt 96-48. Alabama over A&M 61-46. Of course, State 72-58 winners. And then Arkansas gives LSU a scare in Baton Rouge. But can't quite close the deal. 79 to 76. That's your final. So Kim Mulkey's team really, really getting a test from Arkansas. Always interesting in this league. That's the thing too about women's basketball. There's a big gap between the haves and the have nots. But on any given night, you just never know what's going to happen. Yeah, Kentucky one and five in the league and nine and nine overall. So that's, again, a game that we expect to win. 
And quite frankly, we need to win. Again, to get back over over 500 in SEC play. But when you start thinking about what's ahead, next week it's back-to-back road games. You got to do no worse than a split there. And then you got Tennessee. So the next three games, and really I guess you could say four because you go to Ole Miss, you go to Georgia, you get Tennessee here. The Lady Vols are never an easy out. We had never beaten them until a few years ago in Starkville. And then we got to go to Florida. And so three of the next four games are on the road, and you get the Lady Vols at home. So a very crucial stretch here. And you start thinking if you can do no worse than two and two here, you're probably in really good shape. If you can find a way to win three, and then maybe asking a lot, you really take a step forward as a as a basketball team. And then, of course, then you get A&M, you're at Missouri, you get Alabama – you begin to think those games are a little more manageable. But it's crazy to think about that. I mean, guys, it's January 20th. We're five weeks away from the regular season being over for basketball. It's insanity to think about that. Five weeks away. It's like it just started. And we're all, we already have, you know, the end of the season in sight. So you've got to make hay in January to make sure that you're playing meaningful basketball in February. And I feel confident that Coach Purcell's team will do that. But, uh, again, grateful to get the win. And, again, tip of the cap to Johnny Harris and tip of the cap to our fans that uh, were so special with every bit of that. I really appreciate all of you. And on behalf of all the Bulldog fans that couldn't be there, thank you for being so genuine and classy and showing such great gratitude for Johnny Harris, who did an awful lot to help Mississippi State uh, women's basketball. All right, final segment of the show. I told you guys we wouldn't get the full 90 minutes in, but uh, again, we'll see how long we go. I'm tired. I'm tired. Got a long drive in front of me. Maybe that's what's tiring me out, thinking about that long. You know that is? You know, it's like you anticipate being on the road all day, and literally all day. Like when I get up in the morning and I drive, it'll be nighttime when I get there. And people say, Steve, why don't you fly? I had somebody ask me up tonight, why don't you fly? You know, that might be uh, save me a lot of time, but it wouldn't save me any anxiety. Years ago, I'll share this with you. I was uh, on a flight to Norfolk, Virginia, and there was a nor'easter storm off the coast there. And we got some winds here, and we went up and uh, tried to land like three times, and every time it was very harrowing. And uh, you begin to kind of make your peace, man. I start thinking, I'm not going to see my wife and kids again. And it was so incredibly, um, you know, kind of dawning that there was a um, there was a lady that got up and stood up in the plane and started praying. And we landed, and I told God then, I said, if you get me off this plane and get me home to my wife and kids, I think I'm done flying after this trip. Flew home a few days later with no incident, and I have not flown since then. Have it. And don't don't plan to. I guess at some point if I leave the country, you know, I'll have to do that. But uh, I'm not a big, I'm not a good, I've never been a great flyer. Before I had kids, it wasn't a big deal. Before I got married, it wasn't a big deal. I started thinking about how much those people need me. And so I don't fly. I'll drive to Alaska, but I don't want to fly to Jackson. It's just not my thing. Maybe you see things differently. But uh, plus, I like to kind of get out on the road and get away from the computer for a while, right? You know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes you just, it's therapeutic to get out there, and just listen to some podcasts and, and uh, listen to some tunes. Just kind of knock it out, just kind of see the country. I enjoy doing that. I enjoy traveling. But I will admit to you, 17 hours in a car is a long time. And I'm a very efficient traveler. You know, and uh, I play a little game with myself when I drive to New Mexico. Like, I leave here. Like, I've already got, I've got the oil change today. I've already got the, the, the tank filled. When I leave here, I will not stop until I get to the, the great state of Arkansas. So I will drive through Memphis. Now I'll get into Arkansas and I'll stop somewhere and, you know, use the restroom and top off the tanks and get a snack. And then I'm not thinking about getting to New Mexico. I'm thinking about getting to Oklahoma. And once I get in Oklahoma, I'll stop and re- repeat the, you know, the routine. 
Then it's the Panhandle of Texas, which is kind of scenic. There's not much up there, though, to be honest with you. There's not a lot of places to stay. I get through Texas, and then once you cross over to the New Mexico state line, it's just three more hours to Albuquerque. And there's just something about seeing that sign that you're in New Mexico. It seems like you've kind of got it whipped, even though there's three hours to go. But it's this little game I play with myself, and it works. And my hope is this is the last trip I have to make to New Mexico. We uh, have a business meeting we're supposed to attend next week and next month in Nashville, so my wife will meet me up there. And so we'll be able to spend some time there, and then a couple weeks later she'll be home. But I'm not too good to go out there again. I'm not. What's a day in the car? Like, what's a, what is it worth to be with the person you love, right? I mean, would you be willing to drive? Like, okay, I'm going to drive all day to go be with the person that I love. I mean, you make that, that deal every day. You would. And I do. Let's thank our friends at Portico. Our friend Brooks Bryan, part of a great group of developers bringing this wonderful residential development to Starkville. Very easy to find. You turn off 82 on a 12. The very first ride is Pat Station Road. You take a right there. You go through the four-way stoppers, Portico. So give yourself a self-guided tour next time you come through. I think you'll be glad that you did. You'll be happy with what you see. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go all the way up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home, and everything in between. Phase one is completely sold out. Phase two under development now. Many of those homes sold. There are a couple that are still available. There's also some lots and you can have a say in your house plan. You can pick your lot and your house plan. If you need a custom build that can accommodate you. You need more information. I know you do. Call 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. And you can speak to Brooks Bryan directly. If he misses you, he'll call you back. Just let him know why you're calling. Say, hey, Steve told me to call you because I want to make Portico my new home or my second home, my ballgame weekend retreat. I want all my friends and and family to be able to come stay with us when they come to Starkville. Let's all be on one roof together. Be incredible. Again, that's Portico. Make it your next move. Okay, so I had somebody send me this article. I won't say who, it doesn't matter. Uh, But all that said, a lot of you don't like NIL. And that's fair. That's fair. Okay, there are some problems with NIL. There are. It's not going away, and I think nor should it go away. But I think it's important to understand it's not going to end there. Absolutely not going to end there. Now, of course, the NIL stuff started in California. There is another bill that has been reintroduced that is um, involving athletic compensation. Now, I'm going to read some of this to you. We'll kind of skim over it. Dan Wetzel of Yahoo had this. It's the Fair Pay to Play Act in California. And there'll be a lot of people, of course, that'll mimic this legislation when and if it passes. Now, a similar bill was shot down last year, and they put some provisions in that they think will, will, will pass. And so here is basically... How this thing works. It's important to understand this. Basically, it's going to change the amateurism model. And in many respects, we've already done that with NIL. But this is going to make it where players can now share in the profits from certain programs, provided they graduate. And so I like that aspect of it. If we're going to put some money on the table, let's at least make sure that people are going to graduate. So they graduate... And they kind of get a head start at life. But the bill requires schools to share up to 50% of revenue with athletes who compete in programs that bring in twice as much revenue as they spend on athletic scholarships. Now, basically, if you're a profitable athletic department or you're a profitable sport, they're saying that you've got to share some of the spoils with the players. Now, I still think there's some Title IX issues here. Most schools around the country lose money on women's basketball. Most schools around the country lose money on women's athletics. There are some gymnastics programs that make money. There are a handful of soccer programs that make money, but not many. So basically what you're down to is basically football, men's basketball, and in some schools, uh, baseball. But there are not a lot of schools that make enough profit that exceed their scholarship dollars. And so basically, here's how it works. 
Current student athletes' pay would be capped at $25,000 per year while they're in school. But colleges would be required to set aside an equally divided 50% of revenue annually to be paid out upon completion of a degree within six years. So you get a $25,000 a year salary, and then you graduate, and you kind of get this lump sum at the end. At major football programs such as USC, that could equal almost $200,000 a year or $800,000 for a four-year career. Think about that for a second. You could make close to a million dollars from playing college football provided that you graduate. That's a long way from tuition and books. You know, we thought things were getting out of hand with a stipend. And now you could potentially make hundreds of thousands of dollars. And some would say, you know what? Hey, good for the kids. Well, where do you think that money's going to come from? It's going to be rising ticket sales. It's going to be rising merchandising sales. The prices are going to go up there. So we're going to pay that. A lot of that money will come from the TV stuff too. But you know, what does this do to facilities? What does it do to the arms race and facilities? We've already seen that slow down a lot with NIL. So here's what happened the last time. Part of what doomed the bill last year were concerns that by paying football and basketball players, athletic departments would lack the resources to continue to fund scholarships or even teams in non-profitable sports. This time, in an effort to prevent such cuts, there is a second funding option. Now, that's very much a concern. You know, let's say all of a sudden, okay, well, we got to pay football and basketball, so we're going to cut equestrian. We're going to cut rifle. Maybe even cut softball. A school that sees an increase in revenue, even a small amount, can allocate 50% of this so-called new money to pay athletes in those sports. That would likely result in far less money for athletes, if any at all, but it's still considered progress. It, also, it is also the way proponents argue that existing budgets aren't strained to the point of pulling back opportunities for others. USC and UCLA, for example, are about to enter the Big Ten Conference where millions of new money is awaiting. That increase in revenue could save their schools Monday under the new bill. The bill also calls for a three-year ban for any athletic director who cuts teams or scholarships under these circumstances. I don't know what the ban means. That's something that probably needs to be you know, maybe illustrated a little greater here. There are additional provisions in CAPA could be beefed up or stripped down as it goes through the legislative process. It's in committee now. If it were to pass, it is expected to be duplicated by other states, if only out of competitiveness. After the NIL, NIL bill passed in 2019, there was a fear that California schools would enjoy a significant recruiting advantage. Why not go play where you can earn more than just a scholarship? States begin to match or even write more forgiving laws in an effort to outdo not just California, but states that rival programs. Others have sat it out and watched as NCAA has been essentially powerless to stop all kinds of payments to players and recruits. Public sentiment has quickly swung against the NCAA and the amateurism model. This is a full throttle attack on the concept of amateurism, which the NCAA has clung to long after other international sports organizations, most notably the Olympics, have given up. This would feature schools making direct payments to players in addition to scholarships, academic awards, and Pell Grants are already allowed. Precisely how this will play out isn't known, but if it passes, as some expected, college sports will be forever altered, perhaps significantly. Yeah, there's no question about that, Dan. If this passes, you know as well as I do, other states are going to mimic it. You're going to be like, hey, we can't let California be able to get all this money and pay players near a million dollars, so we're going to have to follow suit. And so what does that mean for a school like Mississippi State? Well, it's tough. It's tough. We already have one of the smallest budgets in our league. And now all of a sudden, as Ron Polk used to say, you give us a chump change, now you want to tell us how to spend a chump change. And so where does it end? Where does it end? And why is California always on the front of this? That make a lot of sense to me. Now, you know as well as I do, with all these old miseducated legislators in the state of Mississippi, we're not going to be too far behind. If this thing passes, you better believe Mississippi will be, you know, one of the next to follow. And I don't know that's necessarily a great thing. Now, we don't want to be at a recruiting disadvantage. 
But what begins to happen to your athletic budget? What does this mean for other sports? You know, what is it? I mean, and let's take a quick look here. You know, let's take a quick look at, you know, Mississippi State plays baseball, men's basketball, football, men's golf, men's tennis, track and field, women's basketball, cross country, women's golf, soccer, softball, women's tennis, track and field, and volleyball. Now, we have more women's sports so we can be compliant with Title IX. Do we just stop playing golf? Is that what we do? Are we going to be able to fund that? Do we stop playing tennis? You know, we just built the Pitt Center here a couple years ago. You know, what happens? The money has to come from somewhere. And so if you start cutting these sports, what does it do to college athletics? I've mentioned several times on this show, you know, when my son played college baseball, we had to pay to play. It wasn't, we weren't getting paid to play. We had to pay to play. And I'm very fortunate, and I thank God that we had the, the, the ability to do that. But that's the thing you begin to ask yourself. What's going to happen to people that maybe don't excel in football and basketball? What if somebody is a very gifted athlete, but you know maybe they're an average football player, but they're a ridiculous tennis player? So now all of a sudden, do you remove their possibility of getting their college education partially paid for because they don't play the right sport? We're going down the wrong path here. And I'm not saying that athletes shouldn't share in some of the spoils. But what do you do in these minor conferences? What do you do? In the Southland Conference, what do you do in the Sun Belt? Well, you can say, but Steve, those programs aren't making a lot of money. That's true. And until we see how it works, it's difficult to really, you know, evaluate and judge all that. But, you know, look at how this NIL transfer portal thing has been bastardized. It's not at all what they rolled it out to be. You think this is going to be to the letter of the law? It absolutely won't be. You know, the only good thing about it is it's the schools making the payments rather than donors. The thing that I have said, and maybe this kind of leads us down that path, I think the kids should be able to share in TV revenue. I think you, you unionize, and I know that's a dirty word in many respects, and you have a collective bargaining agreement. And then everybody gets something. And then you could still profit on, uh, you know, maybe having uh, ads or... Um, or jersey sales. Yeah, you know, but I think a lot of these collectives would kind of go away. And maybe that's a good thing. I'm, I'm not against the collectives. I mean, as long as everybody else has them, we have to have one too. But my point being is that if this legislation is already on the horizon, and even though they failed one time, they've reintroduced it with some compromising principles, this thing is likely going to pass. And then all of a sudden... College athletics is going to change. Now, does it keep kids from transferring? Maybe. You know, all of a sudden, maybe I've got a better deal at Mississippi State, so I'm not going to go in the portal and go to to, uh, Louisville. You know, maybe their deal in that state is not as uh, competitive. But this thing is on the verge of running off the tracks in a way that we never imagined. We have become so incredibly student-athlete-centric Now, the thing that I've always said is that there are a lot of people making money off these players. And the way that I always looked at it is, hey, you're getting getting a free education. You're getting a chance to build a brand. You're getting a chance to get your name out there and establish yourself as a marketable employment candidate once you're done playing your given sport. You know, our regular students don't really have the opportunity to brand themselves, right? They have to depend on their resume. They depend on a job interview. It's just not always the case. I mean, how, how many how many young people do you know? It's like, oh, well, well, he played college football at Mississippi State. Well, you know, right out of the gate, when that resume comes across your desk, you're going to grab it. So I remember this guy. I'd love to have that guy working for me. I'd love to hear all the stories. 
That's an aspect of it. So they have name recognition. Regular students don't have that. But whether we like it or not, this is going to happen. And once it passes in California, within you know, six weeks, it'll spread like wildfire across the country, especially in the Pac-12. You think Oregon, the University of Oregon, is going to sit back and say, you know what, hey, we recruit Northern California. We can't let those guys be able to buy those kids out from under us with this new law. They'll be right behind them. And then Washington. And then Arizona. And it'll spread like the plague. You might as well get ready. I'm telling you now, college athletes is athletics is changing. I don't know if it's changing in the right direction. It's been, it's really become all about the money. Now, there's always been money, right? And again, I am I'm a proponent for student athletes getting paid as long as it's legal. There's a level playing field, right? There's always been the better student athletes getting some form of compensation. It wasn't always legal. And so maybe this is a way to kind of clean this stuff up. But if, if you thought NIL was off the, off the chain, and maybe it is, and maybe this is a way that you can um, curtail some of that, I don't know. I think it's still too early in this process to kind of understand how it would impact NIL. But I can tell you there's some NIL fatigue, too. You know, in the beginning of this, it was supposed to be some quid pro quo, like the kids had to do something for the money. And now they're just getting a check. And, again, I think the NCAA needs to enforce the rules. You want to be taken seriously, you hold people accountable. Simple as that. Nobody's going to respect you when you don't enforce your own rules. And it's like the NCAA just kind of sit back and say, oh, it'll figure itself out. No, no it won't. It won't figure itself out. That's probably the biggest disappointment for me in college athletics right now is we have no leadership in college athletics, none whatsoever. All right. Uh, if you hadn't done so, go to dogpilethebook.com and you get a copy of Dogpile, Stark Villains, Alpha Dogs, Flim Flam. You can get those copies signed. If you're looking for Blooms Oleander, you can find that on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksandMegan.com. Stark Villains gear always available at StarkVillains.com. And if you're not a member of JeansPage.com, you should be. What, what, what's, what's the matter with you? we got the best experts when it comes to Mississippi State on the beat. You want information, you want rumors, you want innuendo, you want truth, we're going to give it to you. A lot of that out there these days. You know, we're not clickbait journalists. We're not uh, those kind of people that are just going to write some sensational headline. You can come ask us questions directly. We'll answer them on our message board. But, guys, I'm going to get out of here. i got to get a few hours sleep before I get on the road. And uh, I appreciate so many that have reached out and wished me uh, safe travels. I I can't respond to everybody, but I do appreciate the sentiment. And uh, I will bring my stuff with me, and then we will, um, you know, we'll have a show at some point uh, Monday or so. So I don't know if it's going to be Sunday night. I suspect it will be Monday evening. I suspect that will be the case, Monday evening. I would just about guarantee that'll be the case because uh, we're going to spend Saturday night, Sunday night in Santa Fe. I'm not going to spend my time recording, uh, you know, having a romantic getaway with the wife. I don't know that that would go over really well. Not that I would want it to. But uh, probably Monday evening when she goes and runs, I'll record you guys a show. And so we'll get that together for you. And then uh, I'll let you know on Monday when you can expect your midweek show. But that's it for today. We'll see you guys soon. Enjoy your weekend. Get out and enjoy your family as best you can. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.